I want to talk to you here for a few minutes about how I've proved the King James Bible to be God's Word through the scientific method. Okay? <clears throat> now, there are two ways to prove something scientifically. Whenever you have a product, be it a um, medicine or a vehicle or a technology product, an airplane, uh, whatever. Okay? The two different ways that you can scientifically prove if that, whatever the item is, is effective. Number one, that would be through the ingredients, through um, the chemical or physical makeup of that said item, okay? Um, <clears throat> and the second one would be through uh, the, if that item works, okay? It's put out into a market of some kind and does it follow up to the claims that it makes? All right, if you have a drug, we'll say, well, you have the chemist, the uh, pharmacist, we'll say, that uh, designs the, that drug. I have to come out here in the woods and get some, use a bucket to get some birch bark for our wood stove. That's why I'm out here, and I figured I'd do a video while I'm doing that. Hopefully you don't mind, and if you do mind, well, then stop watching the video. <laughs> but, um, so the scientist comes out, and he says, the, the pharmacist, rather, comes out and he says, I'm going to make something to, we'll say lower blood pressure, okay? Now, what chemicals would go into that? Um, are there natural types of things that I could use that would probably be good at lowering blood pressure? What's out there? What's in the known, you know, the pharmacognosy um, out there? And so he looks and he says, well, I'll take some of this and I'll take some of that and I'll take this particular constituent from this type of uh, plant or herb or whatever. And I'll synthetize, you know, make this one synthetic because it'd be cheaper and whatever else. And the whole point is that he um, finds ways to synthesize a drug. And then he says, okay, there, I can prove that this should be effective and safe and everything else. Okay? He knows what ingredients go into it, in other words. Um, then you have the uh, guy that does the selling of that, and he says, all right, well, I'm going to need to test this. I'll say the, I'll go out and I'll give it to the doctors, and we'll see if this, if this tests out fine and everything else, and we'll have, uh, you know, the blind random studies and things where people will be given a placebo effect. And it's peeling the bark off the tree there if you hear that. And uh, this doesn't kill the uh, birch trees. You can use the bark. It's got different oils and resins in it, which could be scientifically proven. And um, you can use it to start your wood stove. Works pretty good. But you have the doctor then, he prescribes these drugs. And he sees, do they work? How do they work? What reactions do they have and whatever, okay? I need to lay that foundation before I get into the Bible issue. Um, with the Bible, you have the ingredients, which would be uh, a number of different sources that they use when they translate scripture. First, you would have, what were the original writings written in? You have Hebrew for the Old Testament, Greek for the New Testament, some Aramaic type of writings as well, but primarily Greek and Hebrew. Then you have um, different copies that were made of those original manuscripts that existed. And from there, you would have um, ancient translations, you would have citations from early church fathers' writings where they would say, okay, I'm going to be quoting from, you know, 1 John 5, 7, the, they call it the Johannine comma, and you can find early church fathers citing it before a lot of the manuscript evidence was there, which means that the verse did exist in the past. You know, they'll say, well, they only had a few late manuscripts to prove the Johannine comma. Um, well, that's not exactly true because there are early church father citations. Not that I'm defending the church fathers or anything else. I'm just simply saying that, you know, that's one of the ways to prove it that church fathers cited it, so it had to exist back early on. And there's a lot of evidence like that. So you have church father citations, you have manuscript evidence, you have um, old translations, like the old Latin Vulgate, 
um, that came around before Jerome's Latin Vulgate. Uh, kind of an interesting thing because the Latin, old Latin Vulgate would have been there. And then Jerome's Latin Vulgate comes out later. Kind of the new version of the old Latin Vulgate. Hmm. The Catholic Church didn't do anything like that in the future, though. Don't worry about it. Uh, so you have Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, early church father citations, old translations. Okay? And so you can get into all these things and you can get into the debates and the arguments and everything else. And you have a lot of men that get into uh, New Testament textual criticism. And they'll say, well, if you look at uh, Papyrus Fragment 66 or 77 or Vaticanus and Sinaiticus or Alexandrinus or uh, if you get into the Receptus reading here, I don't agree with it because the critical apparatus in the Nestle's text uh, does not give support for this reading. And so, and they argue back and forth. And when I first got saved many years ago, um, I read a lot of the books out there in print, both for and against the King James Bible. And I started to see this thing of, um, you know, the, the debate between different Greek and Hebrew readings. And I started to think, okay, you know, should I study Greek? Should I study Hebrew here? And but I'm seeing this contention back and forth. Well, and it seems like both have good arguments and both can say, well, this actually is not supported by the Receptus or this, you know, this reading here. Uh, the older, better manuscripts don't say this and this and that. And all this argument back and forth. And so I decided to go with the latter type of scientific method to prove the truth of the Word of God. And that is through application. And again, as I've spent my years studying a lot of different movements, um, I remember reading a book about early electricity and some of the um, things that the guys would discover and whatever else, these scientists, and they would come up with theories and they would say, this theory is a little bit too dangerous for me to just try it out on my patients or whatever else. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually try this out on myself. Hmm. That's part of the scientific method. If you're a doctor, uh, why would you cure uh, somebody with a, something wrong with them if you yourself don't want to use that? You know, I remember there used to be a TV commercial back when I was a boy and, and it was some kind of hair treatment thing or whatever to keep you from balding and whatever. And the guy would say, not only am I a such and such, uh, not only am I the CEO of this company, I'm also a patient, you know. And he'd take off his, he'd show his before and after picture, you know, how he got hair now and whatever from taking this product. Well, that's actually a scientific method. Um, I mean, if I'm telling you that birch bark can be used to start fires, but yet I've never done it myself, I'm not actually out here collecting it. I'm just in saying, you know, survival book so-and-so tells you that you can use birch bark to start a fire. Well, have you ever done it, Brother Brian? No, I haven't, but I've heard it works. Well, that's hypocritical. So, I decided, after years of study, uh, I mean, all the study and all the thing of the different manuscripts and the unseals and the cursives and the minuscule and the majuscule and, you know, all the different things. And I just looked at that and I thought, I remember I went to a, I was going to a Baptist church, I'll tell this story quick. And I told the pastor, we were talking about the Bible version issue, he wanted to do a teaching on it, and I said, don't get into the cursives and the unseals and all the other stuff and all the real deep things. It's, you're going to lose people. Didn't take my advice because you don't want to listen to the guy that's not the pastor, you know. And uh, just some jerk that comes to your church there, you know, me. And, and so he starts talking about unseals and cursives and whatever. I gave him a bunch of my materials that he could use from the pulpit talking about this whole issue. He goes off and I see people and they're just kind of looking around, checking their watch, you know. Total, just totally lost the interest of the people. Whatever, he knew better, so good for you. Seminary, you know, Bob Jones uh, University graduate. So, whatever. But um, I got to the place where I realized I don't think New Testament textual criticism is for me. I would like to actually live according to a belief that the King James Bible is God's perfect book. I wonder what would happen if I would do that. Because I always, you know, I always believed that the Bible I held 
was God's perfect word. I never thought, you know, I'd hear people say, well, all Bibles have errors. And I'd think, then how can you claim to be a Christian? <laughs> if, it's in, if it's wrong in one spot, how do I know it's not wrong where it tells me how to be saved and go to heaven when I die? That's a hypocritical stand to take. All Bibles have errors. That's weird. But I decided I'm going to live, I'm going to experiment on myself. And I'm going to see what it's like to live according to the pages of the King James Bible. Let me see what it's like. And so in 2007, I started King James Video Ministries. It was offline. I was making DVDs. And um, I started going around and I started long before then. Um, I think it was actually 2001 when I got saved. Uh, <clears throat> but um, I was going around to different Baptist churches and things. And I, would, I was shocked at how oftentimes these pastors didn't actually believe in the Bible that they were preaching out of making their living out of. Uh, pretty crazy. But I decided, you know, if I'm going to truly believe this King James Bible, I'm going to test it. I'm going to try it. And I started reading stories about the old Christians, about some of the old preachers and the old revivals and a lot of this stuff. And I thought, you know, a lot of these guys, they believed that it was God's book. And some of them wouldn't be called educated, you know. Uh, they were just common men, but yet they did great work for the Lord. And I thought, well, let's try it. And so I began to live my life according to the pages of the King James Bible. Obviously, rightly dividing. I don't go back to the Old Testament and try to live like a Jew under the law or something. Obviously, you have to have enough brains to realize that. You live according to the New Testament. I don't, you know, keep the Sabbath day and whatever else. It's in the New Testament, they're, you know, worshiping on Sunday. You could, you can worship the Lord any day of the week. There's no specific day. And so I began to live that way. And um, did my life change uh, in ways I could not fathom? And I thought, well, I'm just going to make a few little DVDs or something. And I was, at the time, I was a wood turner. Uh, exhibiting my work in galleries and whatever else and I was doing tree work on the side and I was doing some carving and getting into chainsaw carving and logging and you know all kinds of different stuff um, and there's some good stuff right there I'm uh, getting some good bark up here there we go that speeds things up <laughs> but I was doing a lot of different things and I thought I'm not really interested in preaching um, you know, I'll just go and I'll, I'll attend a local Baptist church and I will just be a blessing, you know, there I'll, I'll help. But I couldn't seem to find a church that actually believed the Bible or wanted to follow the Bible. And I started to hear things about, you know, actually there are no church buildings in the New Testament. Um, that whole thing is just kind of a man-made invention. Well, let me search the scriptures. Yeah, they're right. Hmm. And, uh, there's no single pastor thing. It's multiple elders. Huh, that's true too. Weird. Where's the Sunday best at? That's not there. Where's the 10% tithe? That's not there. And I started to get more radical because I was following the book, you know. And um, started to have some brethren, you know, kind of warn me about the way, you know, that I'm heading. And it's a little bit dangerous. I, I appreciate what you're trying to do, Brother Brian. And, and I started thinking, this is a little bit weird here, you know. I'm getting uh, supposed brethren. And they're warning me about uh, following the scriptures. And that I should be following the traditions of men and the teachings of men rather than the Bible. Hmm, that's a little bit concerning. But, you know, I tried and finally it became very clear that the Lord wanted me to start the ministry. And then, you know, actually had an older brother, modern professing Christian, and he told me about YouTube. Hey, you ought to check out YouTube. Didn't say to create a channel so I, so I could put ministry stuff out there. Just check it out, you know. And so I checked out YouTube and um, created a channel in 2009. Or no, 2008. November of 2008. And uh, started making videos. Christian videos. I originally put up some fishing and logging videos. And um, but I put some... Uh, 
another good piece look at that um put some uh ministries type of stuff out there in 2009 then towards 2010 started to get more active with it and uh went away from the thing of offline video through dvds and things to now online video because i can reach more people that way um you know can't exactly sell the videos anymore but you know i can give the stuff away and reach people and uh and I started to bring out truth that the Lord showed me. And I started to see how it was changing other people's lives. And I thought, okay, scientific method. If what I'm saying, if what I'm believing is true, then it should not only work for me, it should work for other people. Hmm. Well, I started seeing it working for other people. And I started to realize, I think this is real. Um, I mean, I'll be honest with you, brethren. If I wouldn't have seen any kind of supernatural power with the King James Bible, I would have abandoned it a long time ago. You know, absolutely. But the power there is undeniable. Uh, not just, you know, in my life, in the lives of my viewers, in the lives of people from all over the world, in the lives of Christians from centuries ago. And I'm seeing this power. And ironically, also... The scientific method would say, well, what happens if, you know, individuals stop taking the medicine that you're trying to promote? If the medicine is good and they stop taking it and they stop trying to be healthy through that medicine, then logically speaking, their health would decline. Well, guess what? I saw that too. And I started to see that people that once followed the ministry and once were doing what I was showing them from the scriptures, all of a sudden they're going back to the world and they fall apart. And I'm thinking, again, scientific method. You see, it works. This whole thing works. And um, give you a good example of what I'm talking about that never followed the King James Bible, but uh, to prove what I'm saying here, James White, you know, Dr. James White. This guy comes out and... Uh, He's attacking the King James Bible, writes a book, you know, on the King James only, only controversy, and, and it's an, an issue riddled by emotion and ignorance. And uh, you look at James White when he first wrote that book, looked like a fairly normal guy, fundamentalist type of Christian, whatever. But uh, all of a sudden he started falling apart as the years went by. You know, going and hanging out with guys that are smoking cigars and drinking alcohol, claiming to be Christians getting tattoos all over his arms, you know, as an older man, you know, not as a young man that made mistakes in his past, as an older man. And uh, I'm seeing this and I'm thinking, this is kind of weird. So uh, again, a man that would say, the King James Bible is not my cure. The King James Bible is not for me. It's not something that I want anything to do with. Um, okay, well then it should affect him negatively, right? Be right back, my battery's dying. All right, sorry about that, battery died. But I've got a full bucket now, so I can head back. But, uh, <coughs> excuse me. But the thing of James White, a guy like James White, a guy like some of these other guys, and, and James White, you know, he's gone into all kinds of liberal stuff now. He's not even a premillennial, you know, believer, doesn't believe in the preacher rapture. You know, just, guy just fell off the deep end you know and um why because you see he didn't take god's book seriously god's book is a joke to james white and so and other guys like that you know they start to question god's book and they fall apart um, i've seen it all my life uh you know literally all my life i mean even when i was a boy i saw people doing it didn't understand what was going on at the time but now i understand a lot of the hirelings that I once sat under their ministries, I realize now that they were not Bible-believing Christians, and that's why they got messed up. So, but, uh, so I've seen and I have proved that the King James Bible is God's book, and nobody's ever going to turn me from that book, ever, for any reason. Um, you know, it's kind of brings to mind the thing of Peter and uh, in John chapter 6, and Jesus is talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood, which is a reference to eating the Old Testament flesh and drinking the blood of the New Testament. That, you know, it's talking about the scriptures. 
and um, <clears throat> and his disciples get a bunch of the people that were following him, not his, not the twelve disciples, but a bunch that were following him, claiming to be disciples. They left him, and uh, Jesus turns to his twelve disciples and he says, "Basically, are you going to leave me too?" And Peter says, "Where would we go? Thou only hast the words of eternal life." It's talking about the scriptures. It's not talking about communion. <laughs> okay, a little deeper truth there that lost people don't get. But um, are you going to leave the King James Bible, Brian? Where would I go? It only has the words of eternal life. I'm not leaving it. Uh, I've proved it for far too many years. I've seen the proof in a lot of your lives, the testimonies that I hear, people that were messed up, drug addicts, uh, people in fornication, people even messing around with sodomy and things like that. And I've seen it. I've seen what it's done to people's lives. I'm not going to leave it. You see, I, when you get into Bible-believing Christianity, it's not that you have to reject science. No, you actually are proving true science, not oppositions of science falsely so-called like the Bible warns about. I believe in true science, something that can be verified and demonstrated. I can verify a change in my life. I can verify a change in other people's lives that stick with the book. And when people don't stick with the book, I can verify that it doesn't change their lives and they actually fall apart. They go right back to the world again and the latter end with them is worse than the beginning, just like the Bible said. So, um, can the King James Bible be proven scientifically? Absolutely, I have. I've done it for years and I'll not depart from that book for any reason. So, anybody out there who wants to write in the comments, well, the King James Bible's good, but it's an error because it doesn't translate this word correctly. Shut up and move along. Uh, you're on the wrong channel. I proved it scientifically and perfectly. And by the way, you say, well, you haven't done the same to new versions. Oh, actually, yes, I have. Um, I used new versions for many years as a modern professing Christian before the Lord saved me and I came to believe the King James Bible. And I still use the modern versions, by the way. Uh, not King James only. I use the modern versions quite a bit in terms of attacking them and showing that they're false and corrupt. Um, I did a whole sermon reading out of the Dewey Reams, the you know, 1610 Dewey Reams, 1582 New Testament, 1610 was when the whole Bible was done. did a whole sermon showing Roman Catholics out of their most holy translation that they have, that their most holy translation still teaches justification by faith, okay? God's grace, man's faith. That's what the Bible teaches, New Testament salvation. Not uh, that you have to go to auricular confession and go the you know eucharist and everything else and um you know venial versus mortal sins and all this other stuff um i can preach i can get truth out of any version because they all copy the king james bible but uh if you want the whole truth and nothing but the truth uh you need to have the king james bible in english or the variant thereof in your language there were a lot of uh receptus type translations that predate the king james bible and a lot of them have great truth in them. But uh, God's seal of approval is uniquely on the authorized version, King James Bible. And I verified it with my life. So you want to come here and try to waste my time? Uh, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel may continue with you. I'm not going to give these people place by subjection. Not happening. Okay? Um, so, uh, if you want to go and be a Bible-believing Christian, King James Bible believer like myself and, you know, millions of others down through the centuries. Um, use the book that God uses. You want to just mess around with philosophies and arguing over the ingredients of what goes into a Bible version or whatever. Well, go ahead. Have at it. Still a free country, somewhat. So, just wanted to make this video. But I have to get down to the office. Get my, uh, there is it. There it is bucket of barch birch bark <laughs> barch barch birch bark back to the our little cabin thing over here so that will be it thank you very much for watching